We're in Union Market right behind me. Um, all right, so tonight is a night of intersections in time and in, and in this place. And I'm just thrilled to have that you are all here. Uh, for skaters who want to come over from the bowl, you know, you're all invited to be part of this conversation as well. But tonight is part of a lot of things. But sort of top billing tonight goes to uh, Art Change U.S. and Kennedy Center National Conversation Series. These are conversations, uh, artist conversations, at the intersection of arts and social justice. And tonight we're uh, talking about issues of placekeeping, urbanism, gentrification in the arts. And that's what brought us to this particular space because it has such an incredible history of hip-hop culture, skate culture, many other forms of culture. So to uh, give the official welcome uh, on behalf of the current keepers of this space, please welcome uh, Max Kazmazada of Gallaudet University. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to keep this really short. Thanks for coming out. This is a uh, you know, this is sort of a, a raw space that, as you can tell, is in transition. Um, uh, my name is Max Kazamzada. I'm a professor, a little bit of background of, of, about the space and how it's connected to Gallaudet University. I'm a professor in the art and media design program at Gallaudet University. I've been there for about eight years, and I'm presently the art, uh, the program director of the art and media design program. Um, and um, I teach art and uh, media design courses. Uh, I usually bridge the gap between uh, fine art education and uh, uh, intricate technologies, whether they be hardware, software. Or, um, and I've been teaching that for uh, longer than th I've been here. Uh, and we had this really interesting, I'm also a skateboarder. I grew up, I, w I got my first skateboard when I was seven, I think. And uh, I haven't stopped skating, and I'm 45 now. And um, thank you, thank you. And one great thing about landing in DC is it's a skateboard hub that I've, uh, I've sort of pictured my entire life. I lived in New York for about eight years, but DC is a huge historic skateboard hub. So coming here and, and joining the Gallaudet academic community, I also joined the uh, DC skateboard community as well, and I have so many friends here that are skaters, including Chico, including Ben, including like you name it, like everybody, everybody here, you know. And I go, I go downtown to Pulaski, and it's a family gathering every day. And um, and I thank uh, the cosmos for that. Um, so, just a little bit about this space. This space actually is an extension space of Gallaudet University. It's not considered campus, but it's considered uh, property of Gallaudet. And uh, there's a long-term plan to develop here in about uh, six years. Um, we have a collaboration with JBG, uh, a large development co company. So the future is uh, questionable in terms of which directions uh, things go. And so the activities that we do here collectively and, uh, and uh, collaboratively could potentially impact the future of this space um, as we collaborate with these large development companies. Um, and they are in conversation with this, and they are supporting the efforts that we're doing. Uh, so actually, um, uh, this, this whole space was, uh, was sort of an empty space. Uh, there were some, some different people that sort of adopted it temporarily from time to time. And, uh, then we, we sort of merged it into this uh, sort of a skate space, skateboard space, and this sort of creative space, this art space this, uh, um, that was more connected to the programming and the, and the academic efforts that were uh, happening at Gallaudet University. And hence the, uh, the bowl that began in the Finding a Line event, the initial Finding a Line event at the Kennedy Center. Um, ended up moving here and landing here and uh, continuing in, um, in providing the community with an, uh, an external skate space that um, could be creative and could evolve and could build and to, could grow into something uh, different and new. And, um, and so this, this effort, uh, is this discussion is all connected, I think, with all of those efforts. And uh, we're uh, glad to be a part of it. Um, 
we uh, are teaching a course that's a required, well, actually, it's a special topics course at Gallaudet um, called Skateboarding, Tracking, and Data Visualization, where we were lucky enough to get uh, an ongoing, endless, annual NASA grant to support the technology to visualize the data that comes gyroscopically off of the skateboards uh, as people skate the bowl. And this is great because we offer it to sophomores, juniors, uh, and seniors at Gallaudet. Um, visual, visual information um, is very valuable to Gallaudet uh, community, to the deaf community. Um, and um, we do teach audio as well, but it's uh, usually through data. So data is a very, data visualization is a very important factor uh, of education and understanding digital processes and technological processes and physical processes. And so uh, from, from my perspective, this is something that I've uh, tried to contribute to this uh, creative effort. Um, anyway, long, too long, but uh, maybe a little boring, but <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you all here. Um, all the contributions uh, that, that in idea form or in whatever way you can uh, to this discussion, I think will benefit Gallaudet community as well as the DC community at large. And um, I'm just wonderful, uh, glad to be a part of it and, uh, and very appreciative that you guys are here today. Thanks so much. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Max. So I was joking about top billing because it can't be top billing. It has to be shared billing with the Hip Hop Theater Festival. Let's hear it for the 17th annual Hip Hop Theater Festival, DC Hip Hop Theater Festival, of which today is, this is the last event. So it's my pleasure to welcome from New York City, the Executive Director of Hires, Mr. Raymond Codrington. What's up, everybody? What's good? Thank you for the introduction. I just want to shout out the Kennedy Center for recognizing both skate and hip hop culture and intersections of both. It's really, I like this space. It has a nice vibe to it, all this art. I saw the people skating when I came up, definitely set the, set the stage for what's going on tonight. So it, it's good to be here. Um, as Garth said, we're in the 17th year. It's a pleasure to be a part of uh, Art Changes US National Conversation. They've put together some really interesting, dynamic, really dope conversations around sort of the intersection of the arts, immigration, diversity, and we're happy to be part of that in any way, shape, or form. Um, what's also exciting for us is that somebody that we collaborate with pretty regularly, Alec, Alice Mizrahi, is going to be on this panel tonight, and she's a really incredible visual artist and, and muralist, and she will definitely be dropping some knowledge on y'all tonight, so you're in for a good time. So on that note, I'm gonna pass the mic to, back to the MC, Gardner. So I don't want to be, I don't mean to be a mic hog, I just want to make sure to give everybody their, their, their special shine. So um, I, I also want to give a, a particular uh, special introduction to the person who brought Skate to the Kennedy Center, who's also one of our discussants tonight and a big connector in this community and a big uh, rehabilitator of, sp of spaces in community and he rehabilitates them for community and creativity through skateboarding and art, and that's Mr. Ben Ashworth of George Mason University. So let's hear for Ben. He will also be dropping some knowledge. But now, the queen of all knowledge, um, a, a very good friend um, who is the, the creator of the Art Change US, or Arts in a Changing America initiative out of CalArts, um, a long time artist and activist and change maker who I don't even think I would be doing what I do if she hadn't been doing what she's been doing for so long. It's my pleasure to introduce Miss Roberta Uno. Thank you, Garth. Okay, so he just said that to tell you that I'm old. Um, I really want to thank you all for coming tonight. Art Change US is a five-year initiative and we decided to look at this moment of demographic change as a moment we could kind of revision the arts in terms of all of us, because of things that happened in the 60s, the Civil Rights Movement, the National Immigration Act, really started to make the possibility that the United States could be a truly pluralistic democracy, right? And, you know, when we started to look at that, we were also looking at 
how people are trying to shift the narrative so that we actually are not part of that or the future does not embrace and hold us all. And so we've been holding these national conversations really to look at what does culture look like, how does it live, where people live, you know, and where is that leadership. So I want to just say that I am so moved to be here today and really want to thank the Kennedy Center and the various partners. But, you know, to the thought that our nation's cultural center should not just be a place, but should also embrace the place where it is. So by coming here, you know, we really want to recognize that we're on Pascataway land, that we are part of a country that connects us all through the cultures that we make and live. And for me in particular, I just have to say that um, I was born in Hawaii, I grew up in LA, and so in the 1960s, my um, brothers and I, there was no such thing as daycare. We pulled apart our roller skates, we sanded boards, we nailed them onto our boards, and we used to pull up the chain link fence of the school across the street from our house. We lived on a house, a hill in Echo Park, push those skateboards under, climb the fence over, and skate that whole school. That was our daycare every single day. So when I, when I saw the little toddler sitting on the skateboard, I wanted to cry. You know, that is kind of how we grew up. We just grew up, and when ball bearings were invented and we saw real skateboards on ball bearings, we were like so, like, oh my God, you know, we saved our money, we got those, the smooth ride, all of that. Um, you know, we, we didn't live in a neighborhood with, with swimming pools, so that, that kind of was going on in a different kind of area than ours. But um, being from Hawaii, the feeling of being able to be on that wave, right? So I was also so happy to see one female out there represents. A, a, I would love to see more women on skateboards, more women in the bowl, that would be amazing. So today, we decided, you know, when I talk about growing up in Echo Park, which was basically a poor community, but a very working class and diverse community. Today, that community in LA is kind of a hot spot for gentrification. And, you know, to question what role do artists play? How can we help to either preserve communities? How can we help to listen to people? Or are we part of the gentrifying kind of canary in the landmine that's, that's creating vibrancy, that's going to attract people, that displaces original inhabitants, and then displaces us, right? And so many of us, I mean, when I think about how I, as a theater director and a writer, have been able to be a working artist all my life, it was because my rent was cheap when I started. I paid like 75 and 100 and 150 dollars a month for rent. You know, we are being priced out. So one of the issues that I've worked on is affordable housing. Um, and today, I mean, we've all, we've had introductions of Ben and Alice, but joining them will also be a third person, who is um, theorist, a an architect. Um, a culture maker and uh, one of my dearest friends who Teddy Cruz, the Teddy Cruz, not the Ted Cruz, the real Teddy Cruz, um, who has been making work on the San Diego Tijuana border and really reconceptualizing the United States within a more global community and really reconceptualizing like how people actually use their neighborhoods and what would that, how would that influence how we develop buildings, spaces, neighborhoods, etc. So we want to welcome Teddy, Alice, and Ben, and they're going to have a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, here we go. <laughs> hey everyone. You seem far, you seem far. Yeah, should we move up? Is that gonna... All right. I feel relaxed. Yeah. It's got a good session. Ooh. Mm. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, here we are. So thank you all for being here, first of all, on this beautiful, warm July day, right? It's a beautiful day out. The Hottest day of the year Yeah. so far. <laughs> so how are we going to begin this? Ben, do you want to get us started? Ooh, okay, you guys have to make sure I don't go on a long ramble, a long ramble because I tend to do that. Okay, so. Uh, Is the sound okay? Yeah. You? yeah. It's good. Okay. So uh, where are we going to start this? Uh, Garth and I have been in conversation about um, these projects that I've been working on with a number of different creative folks around D.C. for the last 20 years. Uh, we actually met at one of the uh, locations where I was developing a space in Blagdon, Blagdon Alley uh, probably 10 years ago now. Uh, and we started talking about the value of uh, having a creative platform where artists of varied media can be in conversation with one another. And those of you that skate know the expression, uh, shut up and skate, right? <laughs> and uh, so I have a history of, of, of wanting to cultivate and uh, really plant seeds in spaces that carry the ethos of skating through the city and becoming more than yourself and kind of merging with everyone around you and you know those of you who grow up skating grew up skating understand that meditative flow experience you're always talking about flow yeah. and uh, specifically I grew up in Richmond Virginia and I would sneak out of the house my parents are watching this right now and I always I always hate this um, but I had a friend that said he was staying at my house and I'd say I was staying at his and we'd go into the city and skate all night. And we would go and reimagine Richmond, Virginia. And we would come in contact with people we never would have met otherwise, a homeless population. Uh, a lot of friends that were homeless that were skaters. We had folks that really had different ideologies than I did in this tight knit community that I came from. And it really opened my mind up. And it just was always, uh, it, I felt as if the city was a, a canvas for me. And I would run into writers that were out cutting their teeth like me under bridges and hanging out in parking decks and, and creating, a, a, we had an alternate reality than the normal nine to five population. And we were reimagining the city and we were getting in trouble for it. You know, we're, we're nomadic and roaming and getting handcuffed, we're, we're painting. And uh, so when I met Garth, I met him at a place people called Fight Club. And like Roberta was saying, it's, it's hard to find these spaces where you can uh, afford to have studio space. But we realized that individually we couldn't afford those spaces, but collectively we could. And we had to share this territory. So you would be banging into the hip hop group on the stage, which was also the deck of the ramp. And you'd have photographers and um, all sorts of folks coming into the mix. So I have a series of those behind me, uh, working with a lot of the people in the audience here. And uh, Garth asked that we figure out a way to formalize this sort of ethos of, of our shared cultures of sort of urban street culture and bring it to the main stage at the Kennedy Center. So. Um, we did that two years ago. We had this leftover bowl structure that's sort of a seed. And the concept for me is that the seed can land in a new context and evolve relative to that context and to the new group of people that come to the table. So on any given day, we've got photographers, we've got people just showing up saying, what is going on here? How do I get involved? And we say, well, the grass needs to be cut. And <laughs> Max is working on some robotics research and so I did just ramble but I think that covers sort of the, the my understanding of the history of this site and some of the other kind of sites around town maybe you can relate to this as well coming up in Brooklyn in the Bronx Queens, Queens. Queens excuse yeah, me I'm a Queens queen <laughs> so similar to the skate culture skate culture in New York was pretty big when I was growing up as well 
you know, it was a mashup of subcultures, right? You had the skaters, the graffiti writers, the punk rockers, the hip hop heads, the photographers. We're all kind of mashed up into grimy spaces where we can exist, right? right? And we always found outlets for that, whether they were legal or illegal. Of course, now there's a whole surge of love for what we do, but when we started doing it, even before us, we're standing on the shoulders of giants who had built the spaces for us to even get right. close to being where we are right. today or where we were when we were growing up. Um, you know, even people from you know, the 60s movement and, and civil rights and, and activists and, and sociologists and people who were creating spaces for these activated art space were working on this stuff way before us. Yeah. But they really laid down the groundwork for us to come and pick it up and run with it. And what you're seeing today is a whole surge of people who love street art, who praise graffiti culture, who love skate culture. I mean, I remember when I was growing up, we were considered vandals and derelicts. All my skater friends were like, they were like in society considered like just yeah. derelicts, right? That were just running amok, skating everything that they can see. And same with graph writers. Right? You would see tons of graph writers trying to kind of get into spaces just to get up so that they were able to catch some sort of notoriety or fame. A lot of these kids came out of the South Bronx who really came from areas that were devastated and buildings were burning and buildings were being sold for like pennies on the dollar. And when you come up in that environment, you really want your name to be up there. You want to be heard, you want to be seen, you want to be known. And so I think that whole subculture that I was immersed in in New York at that age really informed who I am today, both as a muralist, as an art educator, as a activist, as a woman uh, who works for social justice and rights around women's advocacy work. All of that has played such a big role in my practice and being able to you know, stand next to amazing urban planners and people who develop theory like Teddy and you know Ben, who's making a, amazing impact in communities by building spaces for both youth to be engaged and even adults who still skate, you know. So yeah, that's that's kind of my spiel. But take it away. Yeah, you're too, I mean, there are obviously immediately so many issues that we can open up, uh, critical issues that would really inspire us to rethink urban development and rethink really the way public space is understood. Um, rethink the value of community participation and reimagining the city and so on. Um, so maybe I can begin just by saying how amazing it is to be here. Obviously, we've been in conversations loosely. Uh, but for a moment when I, uh, Roberta, and we began to talk about this, you know, coming to this event, I thought, you know, it was going to be at the Kennedy Center in an auditorium and inside the <laughs> institution. And, and even though I believe in institutions, and in fact, in the relevant role that institutions play today in, in, in reinvesting in, in, in a public imagination, the conversation needs to be uh, sort of brought out, outward into the community. And I think that it's so great immediately to arrive, I mean, I'm barely kind of landing from the train station, and arrive here and, and see, in fact, the place that could inspire, the, obviously, and organize our conversation this evening. Not only that, obviously, this is a, a place that has incredible history, I imagine, uh, but also to see it uh, as a kind of leftover space that is now active or beginning to be activated by a variety of conditions. And I would love to maybe begin to speculate on how those conditions really inspire me a lot. But then I get, I get here and I see, my God, Ben, one of the you know, persons who we are obviously opening the conversation with, he's skating, <laughs> he's sort of, practicing what he uh, believes and you know, what he uh, professes. And I think that for me, even though I'm not a skateboarder, and, uh, and I, uh, but I've been inspired immensely by, by what skateboarders can teach us in, in, the, in, in their relationship to the city. But just to see you blurring you know, theory and practice and to understand that public space and to really engage public space is not just a way of describing it, but it's really a way of performing it. You know, it's, it's really a praxis. Uh, and it's a set of procedures that begin to inspire us to, in fact, reorganize our own, our own, uh, our own uh, practice, right? I mean, I'm an architect, again, um, engaging the border region between Tijuana and San Diego, 
a hugely hot spot at this moment, obviously, at a, at a time when the border has been uh, again criminalized and understood as a site of polarization and so on. I, I've always imagined the border as a site of urban and political creativity. And at some point, I think that it is that that skateboarders, in, in, the, in the way they reimagine and, and engage the city, uh, begin to present a set of strategies. I, I remember a, a friend of mine, an artist from Tijuana, a Mexican artist from Tijuana, who once told me we were facing the border wall, which is this awful artifact made of steel. And he said, the wall is there, he said, only to be transgressed. And it, it, isn't that the ultimate aspiration of art and culture, to transgress our own fears? our own conventions. And I think that when skateboarders engage the city by occupying uh, vacant sites, by transgressing jurisdictional boundaries in order to enact a sense of possibility in those leftover spaces, I think as an urbanist, I cannot uh, be but in inspired by that se those sets of strategies. And so a lot of my practice, in a way, uh, has looked at informal urbanization, bottom-up urbanization, whether it is in the epicenter of an immigrant community that is trying to reinvent its own modes of sociability, uh, public space, uh, sense of or, uh, social and economic uh, uh, sustainability. I think that there is something about, again, the performative dimension of, of, of the informal, of informal bottom-up urbanization that, again, is enacted and performed by skateboarders. I, I wanted to begin with that. I, I, there are many other things, you know, that I could say about it, I mean, in terms of what might be the strategies, specifically speaking, that the skateboarding, the skateboards, uh, skateboard parks, uh, and, the, and the activation of the, of the vacant sites of the city can teach us once we translate those attitudes and those procedures into urban paradigms, into actual forms of development that can be a lot more inclusive and participatory. Participatory. Yes. That's a big yes. word, right, yes. in our practice. I feel like all three of us have that kind of this, the same aesthetic in that sense where we really look to, um, and we were talking a little bit about this today and yesterday, really about what collaboration means and what, what the possibility of collaboration is when we all come together and have the conversations in a really honest and thoughtful way and really kind of shed all of that stuff that was conditioned into our minds growing up and in right. institutions and studying and learning and really kind of shedding all of that, sitting at a round table, having those conversations of what we see in spaces that maybe can be engaged in a more thoughtful approach and really considering the residents that live in that space as opposed to just going in, dumping what we think belongs there and then saying, peace, I'm out to my next gig. Right. So I think collaboration with every, every activated space or any space that I've ever gone into, whether you know, we are being compensated for that or whether we're doing it for the love. I mean, I started my career painting murals because I love to do it and teaching because I love to do it. It was something that I just enjoyed. And now it's, it's really kind of taking on this, this snowball effect where from every job or every opportunity that I've got, I've been able to really see that the crux of the work really comes from a collaborative space, from being able to have those conversations with people, really honestly going into neighborhoods, going into communities, and having those uncomfortable conversations that we maybe don't want to have, but have to have in order to engage that space in a thoughtful way. So I know that you do this a lot too in, in your work. It's really all about collaboration and even seeing this morning how you were setting up you know, everyone is really, there's no kind of top-down attitude, right? right? I, I think a key word here is empathy. Yeah. And, and I think that we're all, or I, I, I was raised with these preconceived ideas, not deliberately, of the other and these ideas of people different than me. And uh, going into the city and skating, and it, there's an equal playing ground in the public domain, and it's, we might not even speak the same language, but we're, we have this common language of skating and exploring physics of movement and reimagining an embankment that goes up the glass of an actual bank. Oh, that glass is really thick. If you ride up this, you can go up on the glass. I mean, how radical is that? Yeah. Uh, but what I'm saying is, I think 
empathy is at the core of what happens when you work together and you, you have this common ground and ultimately that's what I'm after here. So I, I have this thing, I, I always try and hand the reins to different people so that if it all goes wrong I can go, it's Mike's fault or it's Dolo's fault or it's Chris's fault or you know, whoever. But really it's, it's about, I, we're just different and if we're gonna share this territory we have to let each other lead in a dance with one another really. Right, so it, it's we're just passing energy back and forth. So, yeah, is that fair? Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, I, I think that obviously that's one element in my work, at least that I, I'm trying to figure out how to translate in terms of how to reimagine urban development at the scale of communities. Because obviously, what I've learned in immigrant neighborhoods is not only the value of their what I call sort of invisible stealth entrepreneurial, social, economic kind of dynamics that, that in, in fact can inspire us to reimagine land use, zoning, and right. so on. Um, but primarily also the, 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 the kind of capacity uh, to collaborate and, and to, to socially organize. And because when, I, and we talked about this before, I mean, I, I, I trace the history of the construction of a skateboard park in San Diego that Ben knows very well. And, uh, and, and I was compelled by the fact how this group of teenagers invaded this space under the freeway in San Diego. And after being stopped by the police and evicted, the teenagers got pretty pissed off and, and they decided to fight back and they decided to organize themselves deeply in order understanding how, what kind of process they could construct together. So it was not enough just to go to the place to protest, which we must do nevertheless, but in this case they were aware that they needed to construct a, a political process. And they began to understand, you know, gain awareness of who owns that space, right. who, whose jurisdiction this is, uh, who has the resources, and they began to piece together a very interesting story and they, they engaged city officials. It's a long story, but the, the, the issue is that they actually ended up gaining the rights to occupy the space by a transference of liability from the public to the semi-private, believe it or not, because they form a nonprofit. They were in charge of really uh, fundraising and, they, and, and managing the types of activities that would happen there. What I'm trying to say is complex because at the end of the day, public space needs to be made more complex because public space is not just a site of beautification or leisure. It needs to be injected with programming, with, with funding, with support systems that might emerge from new forms of coalitions across sectors, universities. I've mentioned a couple of things about the, the relationship with universities university here that is very important. But at the basis of that whole process that was so compelling to witness is that they organize themselves. And I think that, that that sort of idea that what precedes urbanization might be a new um, form of social engagement that depends on new, new strategies of organization and, and participation. You know, I think that that's, obviously uh, there were questions that emerged in that uh, story of the skateboard park because the skateboarders, the skaters were hugely professional. And so at some point, the space became again kind of exclusive to a particular, uh, how would I call it, uh, expertise, let's say. And so we were wondering where are the women and maybe teenagers or even younger people. And so obviously the question of when we think of participation and inclusion, we ourselves who obviously believe in the possibility you know, of collaboration and, and so on and all these different types of strategies, we have to question, you know, how to, how to enable that, that, that plurality of, of engagement and, you know, so and, and obviously a place like this that occupies a particular community, which I don't know, I've just, just arrived here, but what is the role of those who live within the, the, the kind of, uh, or around the environment and to what degree they gain ownership as well of the space I mean, there are all these questions that, that emerge. I later maybe, so I you know, don't hijack the microphone, but I would like to open up some, a set of reflections about this relationship with the university, with Max, Max's project and so on, which I find compelling. Anyway, but yes, participation needs to be complicated. Uh, we throw it around many times, uh, collaboration. Uh, we need to, I think, um, enable um, more meaningful processes where we are just expanding our own sort of social bubble and we begin to engage institutions at large and all, all the types of, of you know, strategies. Well, let's work on that blueprint. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I'm saying let's work on okay. that blueprint. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> We've got lots of uh, shady uh, bridge spots around town that people are just salivating for to build uh, skates, skatable spaces, shared you know, community platforms. Right. So uh, I would love to figure out, uh, you were talking about skateboarders being very um, professional. We're chameleons. We, we, right. we're, we're, we're selfish. I mean, we, want, we know what we want and we figure out, oh, we need to act like this. We need to dress up a little bit if we're going to go into this context. And it's, we're tricksters is it, what we are. Wonderful. And what, let me clarify. Obviously, all I'm saying, obviously, how to engage a more plural sort of demographic composition. But more than anything, what I was trying to say is that you, uh, both of you, obviously, in, in your own practice, have become not only you have not only intervened through your own performatic sort of engagement and commitment into spaces and so on, but you have acted as curators, uh, organizers of the community of, you know, and, and, and summoning maybe capabilities uh, inside those communities. So I'm, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that while obviously in the case, I'm just re referring to the case in San Diego because I realized that very soon after they won the case, this group of skateboarders, the space became hugely exclusive just for these elite uh, uh, you know, uh, skaters. But incrementally, they began to open up. Uh, they began to curate meetings with others, even if those others were not skating, but there were happenings that would occur in the space. They began to negotiate ways of having, uh, through time, uh, moments when kids would come to do other activities. So it was interesting to witness how the culture of this, the skateboarder began to mutate into a culture of the curator, of the urban curator, you know, to facilitate other types of activities as well. Yeah, well, that's a good point because I feel like as creative thinkers, whether you're an artist or whatever you do in your life, if you're a creative thinker, um, you know, it's a great time to be here doing things because there's so much work to be done. So if we can, really sit down and, and think about these ways in which we can problem solve creatively with these old rigid structures that no longer serve us, right? Really sit down and think about, okay, this doesn't work. We don't like the way this feels anymore. We're now the generation that's kind of leading the way. So let's break that down and rebuild another structure. And how do we do that? So there are many ways. One is through education. You do it in the classroom. You work with students, you go in, you infiltrate the education system by going in, closing the door, and showing them the raw dog way of how to build up, right? Yeah, yeah. And so we do that, right? We do that through education, through working with youth, through community organizing. And you know, this word community is such a buzzword right now, and gentrification, such a buzzword. It's all like really hip, and everyone's talking about it. But really, I mean, this has been going on for a long time. So it's, I'm just so happy to be here at this time where I now have ability to contribute, and so do so many other people. And so the creative thinkers, I feel, really need to kind of step up and lead. Lead in a way that's not, a sh not shameful, but really taking ownership in a way that's powerful empowering to other people mm -hmm. with no ego because that doesn't work. We've seen it. It just doesn't work, right? So, you know, one way, and, we, and I've talked about this in, in quite a few conversations, um, you know, we see people being pushed out. And this is something I deal with often where I get called from a developer and they're like, oh, huh, we're redoing Bushwick and we're beautifying it. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that half of Brownsville is getting pushed out because I don't want to be part of that problem or the solution because what you're doing is you're beautifying the neighborhood with my art and then you're raising the rent on the block, which means that I didn't contribute to any positive change. All I'm doing is actually contributing to your pocket. So there's this fine line of being able to, when you get a job, really, you know, people think that they, that we need them. But actually, when I go on a job interview or a gig and someone's hiring me, I'm asking them a million questions. Like, what is this going to be used for? Who's moving in? Who's the developer? What's going on here? Who's the community? Does the community, do the people in this neighborhood, do they own their properties? Because if they don't, maybe we need to think about where we're placing the mural and why is the mural being placed here. So it's, it's a really kind of in-depth, honest conversation if 
you are considering the neighboring residents. Now, another thing is if you're moving, if you're working in a neighborhood and you're thinking about, well, is this project gonna mean that there's a whole redevelopment? So why don't we think about ways in which we can empower the neighborhoods where we work in to develop skills on how to buy property? Like, be, people are being pushed out, and that's an issue. Mm -hmm. So let's, as artists, or as change makers, or whatever we're called in this space of hu the human race, like, develop programs that teach people how to buy property, how to get a mm -hmm. mortgage, how to approach a bank for a mortgage. Like, these are basic <laughs> skills that yeah. can be taught all around yeah. the world. No, that's, like, that's, that's, that's very interesting. I think that we are in, uh, in alliance in, in, in the context yeah. of this. I've been in my own terms, trying to really make the same argument that it is not until communities can really own their own modes of productivity and participate really in the logics of urban development. So there is no reason why communities, nonprofits, architects, artists could s steal the knowledge of the developer yeah. uh, uh, to, to manipulate time and, 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 and resources and, and begin to argue for a new form of development that enables communities to be co-producers and co-curators, you know, and co-owners. Yeah. So that, exactly. that would be the only way to really begin to prevent the kinds of gentrific gentrification patterns. Yeah. But, but you're right, I, I've been so upset at, at even the most, at times, seemingly progressive attitudes towards urban development in the last years, including new urbanism. I don't know how many of you know about these sort of terms in terms of urban development, but the creative class, new urbanism, attitudes that really have not give us those tools that yeah. end up just really paving the way for gentrification because on the one hand it's just really a, a project of beautification as you are saying yeah of seemingly of improvement but only benefits uh, doesn't benefit the community in the long term but also the creative class where art and culture is used really as a as a kind of way of paving uh, the, the, the road to, to developers to obviously to privatize. But at the end of the day, it's exactly what Roberta Uno said in, initially, it's about uh, 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 the lack of affordability. I, I was actually resonating Roberta's words because I read a, a little bit of an introduction to a, a book that Ernest Hemingway wrote a long time ago called The Moving Fe Movable Feast or something, where he was talking about how all these artists who flocked to Paris, the reason they went there, you know, this sort of mythical moment in that city was not because Paris is beautiful, it's because rent was cheap. Exactly. And, and there were spaces, you know, for artists to really produce. And so I think that when, if we don't bring that conversation uh, forcefully somehow, you know, that, that to, to demand uh, affordability and, and to really enable communities to participate in new forms of urban development, it's very difficult to advance the culture. Yeah, yeah totally. And, and we, see it, we see it happening in spaces like Miami, and we spoke a little bit about this when we were uh, when we were just getting to know each other on the call. You know, there's an area in Miami called Wynwood that has, you know, before it was Wynwood, <laughs> it was a really rough neighborhood where you went to get drugs. And there were like maybe two or three CD dive bars in the area and it was full of warehouses, industrial lofts and I think maybe one or two bars. And past 10 years, Tony Goldman, who was the same guy who helped develop Soho back in the day, um, bought a lot of the property, developed restaurants, and then brought in tons of artists to paint murals all over the walls and make it cool, right? So now we have Wynwood crawling with murals all over the place. That's amazing. It gives us as artists opportunity, but then, <laughs> it moved the Porsche dealership in, and the Mercedes dealership, and all of the cool trendy shops that wanna be close to murals and street art and this whole height. And, you know, I mean, I'm not complaining about it, but when it, when it does something to the communities that surround that, it's a problem. And it is affecting the neighborhoods. So, you know, places like Miami Life Project, who Roberta and I both know and have, have worked with, you know, they've been in their place for quite some time now, a theater company, and their lease is about to end, and they probably will not be invited to renew because it's going to be an exorbitant amount of money. So where does that leave them? They're now gonna go to another neighborhood and make that neighborhood cool and everyone else will follow. So it's kind of like, as artists, as creative thinkers, you know, 
when we move into new spaces, we, we really have to be thoughtful of what we're doing, you know? And, and yeah, so, yeah. oh yeah, questions. Uh, you know what, one of the questions here, Ben, I don't know if you want to add something else or? Uh, real briefly, real okay. briefly. Yeah. Uh, I have a history of being sort of nomadic and uh, like I said, we had Fight Club and uh, I think it's luxury lofts now and the, the climate is much different than it was when I was there. And within the community of artists that I've been working with over the years, we have more of a exchange economy where we use favors as currency. So you might have someone that has more money than other folks in the group and they'll supply this thing that we need for this sort of uh, roving utopia that might move from Blagden Alley to GSL for a minute. Uh, for those of you, uh, most of you know what GSL is, Green Skate Lab. But we have these sort of sites where we can have these little utopias, and, and they're a moment in time, and, and we can get away from this alternate reality that just causes you to fight and crawl all over one another and tear each other apart. I like um, the idea of modular moving things. Can I see that? Right? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I should have read no, that. So, that's yeah. all I wanted to okay. say. Yeah. yeah. No, actually, if, if following on this, because the question is, I would like to hear conversation about how creators can learn to become investors, or is there a model of grassroots investment that, can, that we can follow? You know, again, which is really what you opened up, and I, in terms of my work has been essential to open up the question, can communities become developers of their own housing, of their own public space? What are the tools? Now, obviously, one of the major crises today, among many, is really the crisis of knowledge transference. You know, how to translate the, the knowledge, really, of development. You, you said it, how to expose it, how to, how to inject into communities and to even public spaces the tools that can increase a community's capacity not only for political action, but to participate in development. I, one way that is very specific, at least this is a very personal case, um, is really uh, the fact that I discovered at some point through a friend of mine in San Diego that architects, uh, our fees in designing a project, they are already 10% of the construction cost. Okay, so our sweat equity is already has a value. If we collaborate with a nonprofit, which is what I do in San Diego, a nonprofit that owns land in, in impoverished, underrepresented neighborhoods. They have track record uh, for social service, for cultural activity. And as a professor of the university, University of California, San Diego, I've been trying to push my chancellor to, uh, with, you know, with my partner, Fona Foreman, back in San Diego, to really begin to leverage the economic power of the university so that our community partners can really uh, have leverage to uh, have access to public lands and to even particular subsidy structures. So I'm trying to summarize what is complex, but when you triangulate and to summon and bundle all of those capacities, I think that we can begin to make an argument for constructing a new type of performa that can make a case for developing housing in public space. And then finally, I went to uh, Medellin, Colombia, which I found to be one of the most progressive cities in the world for what they were able to, to achieve in the, in the early 2000s when Medellin was transformed from the most violent city in the world in a few years into an example uh, of ur an urbanization of social justice and inclusion. They were asking the same question, how can institutions invest in the most impoverished, underrepresented, underrepresented sectors of the city? So they summoned universities, they summoned nonprofits, industry, even the private sector, to re-engage a civic conversation, almost like a new deal, almost like a, like a Latin American new deal in a sense, to um, argue that public space in, those, in the development, uh, in economic and community development, could not just be a space of leisure or neutrality, but needed to be a space of education, where knowledge is constructed in collaboration with communities. So universities began to plug in resources into public space. Coalitions were formed between nonprofits, uh, government, and the private sector, and in fact, civic philanthropy uh, to invest into those uh, environments. In other words, they made an argument that public space is not only physical, 
that we can not only design the physical space, when it, but we also need to design the protocols, the funding mechanisms, the, the cultural programming that emerges out of this cross-sector new form of collaboration. So again, when you pair that possibility of universities uh, connecting to communities in such a way, and when artists and their praxis begins to be legitimized as having a value, uh, a, 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 you begin to produce a cocktail, I think, that could be an interesting model to rethink uh, urban development, even at a small scale, in communities. Yeah, and I feel like it's slowly happening, right? Like, mm -hmm. their artists are really stepping up in that space and work, working more collaboratively. Um, can I read this one? Can I read this question? How can we use hip hop as a tool to keep youth uh, from social ills like substance abuse and towards social justice? Is that, is, is, was that one of the questions? Or, this, or, or these were cars from This is a from, perfect from another, question. Yeah? This is a perfect question for me because I work with hip, I work with High Arts, which is um, a sister organization of Hip Hop Theater Festival. And I use hip hop as a tool all the time to teach the youth. And in one way that I can say that I use it is we've created a class with high arts called the Black Book Master Class, similar to the way graffiti writers used to use the bench at the subway station, and they would write in their black books as they would watch the trains passing by with the pieces they did the night before. It's similar to that model where the students come in. We curate a set of 13 students who come in who are interested in graffiti, but because New York is so strict, in a way where now there's no writing on trains, only on the streets or freights, we decided that this would be kind of a good platform to bring the students in to teach them about graffiti culture from the pioneers of the movement. So I develop a 13-week curriculum, and we have guest artists come in and really talk to the students and break down how hip hop was the stepping stone to all of this creative explosion during that time. So that's one way um, I've done it. I don't know how. Javier Starks, who a lot of folks here know. Hav is great. He shows up. He shot a video at Bridge Spot where he activated all the graffiti on the walls and, and engaged all the skaters to be working with him on a piece there. He's a total positive force in town. He was part of the Finding a Line project at the Kennedy right. Center. He, he worked with us. I'm looking at uh, Chico over here. We, for the funk parade, and the guy was skating around rapping with us while we were skating. So mm. in a lot of ways, it's embedded in this ongoing project. Yeah. Yeah. He's their hip hop uh, local. But so I'd like to add, so he, yeah. he added in, so he used the rap culture without profanity and taught the youth that there's a positive way to look back from all the struggles and to grow with awareness. Did you guys hear that? Yeah. All right. OK, I've got a question. Uh, how did each of you get your start, and when did you know you had to take your passion seriously? Good All right, question. I really went deep at the beginning <laughs> with how I got my start, so if one of you guys would like to. I got my start from graffiti culture, straight up. My brother was a graffiti writer, a DJ, put me on at a young age without even knowing. They were spinning on cardboard. I was like, oh, you guys are cool. Can I sit there and watch? And I did. And then that became part of me. Um, as I grew up, then I went to art school. When I was 17, I left my neighborhood. And I met other people who their brothers and sisters also spun on cardboard and listened to hip hop. So I was like, oh, wow, this isn't just me. This is a whole subculture of a melting pot of people that like this kind of music. Um, and from there, I just kind of felt at home. And going to art school was the best thing for me, because in high school, I felt like the weird art freak that had really big ideas, and so that were, in, to most people, impossible. So going to art school kind of made me feel like I was amongst other freaks who had big ideas, and that made me feel really good. Um, after that, I started working as an art educator, still was painting um, a little bit illegally, but a little bit legally as well, and then just was kind of in the right circles, networking, building relationships, education, mm -hmm. knowledge, schooling helped a lot. Um, could, and then, yeah. Could I say something to that? I, I'm thinking about the cross-pollination that happens between yeah. graffiti culture, skateboarding, hip-hop, and there's an adaptation. In one case, you're reinterpreting two turntables and a microphone. You're not just playing a record. Yeah. 
And in another case, you're reinterpreting the urban environment just by physically engaging it and creating this radical uh, imaginative space. Same thing if you're painting, that's your canvas. Yeah. So everything's, oh, where am I going to get up? Oh, I mean, yeah. I saw a guy in DC one time, or that might have been a girl. It had, the, you know, the signs that flip? You see one side and then it flips and you see the other. So they're up there working on a piece, and then when it flips, they start working on the other piece. <laughs> Crazy, huh? Yeah. So you're adapting. You're yeah. adapting. Right. And it's a, I think that we pick up from one another that ability to adapt and, and really push it. There's a sharing. And that's sort of tangential from you talking about coming up with all these other crews, yeah. subcultures. The best is the best feeling, and because you just mentioned about it being a girl or a guy, the best feeling is when I'm on a lift or on a wall really high up, and I'm usually wearing coveralls. If it's cold, I'm wearing a hoodie, and I'm painting, and I'm zoned out. And someone will come up to me, usually a guy, or, and be like, yo, bro, that's really cool. And I turn around, and I put my hood down, and they're like, oh, snap, that's a woman. And that is like the best feeling in the world, because I remember as a young girl watching my dad do things that a young lady wasn't supposed to do. So breaking any kind of like, any of those gender expectations is a really big thing for me. It really pushed me a lot when I was a young girl of what my parents had expected and then what I actually did. Um, so that really helped define. And then the last part of that question is, um, when did I start to take my passion seriously? I knew right away that that I was gonna be somewhat of a creative person because I grew up in that type of atmosphere. So at a really young age, um, I remember in high school I was walking down the street and saw a crack in the sidewalk and it looked like a face and I was like, that's it. I'm gonna be in the art world. And that was it. From that moment on, I just kind of went full throttle and did it even against my parents' wishes. And um, you know, today they're really proud, so. You know. it, is, it, is a, it is a fundamental question. Um, I mean, obviously, all of us go through a process, a, a set of struggles uh, through which we organize our own belief systems, our norms, ultimately our practices. Um, for me, again, uh, I was educated as an architect in, back in Guatemala City in Central America, and it was not until I migrated in the early 80s into the US because of the end of the Civil War and a variety of things that I landed in this amazing place, which is the border, San Diego. San Diego, I just ended up landing there because of a miraculous sort of set of circumstances. And as I began to traverse that border territory and I was going to architecture school, I realized that everything that I was witnessing on the ground, the kind of, not only the social and economic inequalities that are so physicalized in this border territory, but all the incredible dynamics that occur in informal settlements as people build their own houses with their own resources and their own entrepreneurship, immigrant communities that I was sort of moving through. Uh, when I began to realize again that somehow identity is not just a thing, but it's a process. And even though some of those communities obviously belong to the Mexican American in this case, or how would you call it, I don't know, in Guatemala community, I was beginning to, I, I, I began to be dissatisfied also in the way we just to quickly package identity as a set of images, uh, when in reality what I was witnessing were, again, how people negotiated boundaries, resources, activated a space. It was a more performative dimension of identity. So all these questions that began to really accumulate in my mind began to make me hugely dissatisfied with my own field, with architecture itself. So I think that our start, and I think is for many of us the same, begins with a, a sense of dissatisfaction. And when we need to, we are pushed to reinvent our own, not only lives, but our own way of practicing. And so uh, eventually I began to pretty much be one of those spokes people, how do you say it? Uh, to claim the value of, of bottom-up sensibilities to reimagine top-down institutions. And why not to say, it's exactly what you said, to reimagine education itself uh, as a more experiential, performative uh, set of practices. Oh, oh, then, yeah. that up. No. oh, there was a question that is very, 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 very. OK, very so yeah. I've got one here. I noticed that there are no black people on the panel. Don't you think the representation is important? I'm doing my best to represent a very diverse crew of skateboarders here. Um, 
Yeah, I, I don't mean, know. I don't know. Coming from <laughs> New York, I can say that melting pot. I when I grew up, I didn't feel that there was. I, I didn't feel the difference as much as I feel it when I travel. In New York, there's such a mashup of, 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 of people and energy that, that I didn't feel it as much as I do when I travel to other places and I see the clear divide in neighborhoods. And why, why that's not represented? I feel like I represent my city. And in my city, there's a whole lot of diversity. And so, Maybe the color of my skin is not that, but I do feel like in some ways I do represent that. And I know that that's a bit controversial, right? Being a woman who's of Sephardic heritage and comes from a war-torn country and being a first-generation daughter, but of, of Israel no less, right? My parents grew up when it was Palestine and then were there during the occupation. And so, yeah, so as much as that's not me right here, I feel like it is very much me because of what I grew up with, who I was around, who I engaged with, how I grew up, the conversations I had honestly. So that's, that's yeah. my answer. I appreciate uh, that question, whoever asked it. I just I got a, a note that we have 10 more minutes. So let's, I imagine, begin to wrap up. But there are some really yeah. dense and complex questions that just arrived. So, are, are some uh, of these questions from people in the audience also? This is a good one. These are fantastic questions. Yeah, okay. they are. Where do you draw the line on what projects to you, or for who you work with. As, you, uh, as a full-time mural artist, painter, and socially engaged feminist, I want to do all the right gigs, but also need to pay the bills. I am left at times feeling like I sell out to development companies. Who asked this question? Amazing question. I knew it was Rose. Thank you for that question. <laughs> um, you have to really like, like align with what your values are. And whatever you feel works for you, that's what you need to do. Because everyone's gonna tell you, oh, you're selling out this and that, but that's according to their value system. So once you define what your value system is and where you feel like you don't feel like you're a sellout, like for me, I would never work for a cigarette company because I can't do that, I work with kids. So that would be me like being like an advocate for a cigarette company. So I know that that's not aligned with my core values as an artist and educator, so I don't do it. But, you know, I just got hired for a gig in Vegas to do a mural in a restaurant that was a commercial gig, and they paid me pretty nicely. And the whole concept was, uh, you know, a first-generation woman, Latina flavor, but still kind of, you know, funky with, you know, a mashup of, of identities and... And I felt that that aligned with who I was, that it was honest to who I was, and it wasn't me faking the funk. So I did it, right? So it's really, I think, about looking at yourself, developing those core values, looking at how you grew up, getting rid of what you don't want, keeping what you do, adding what you want on as part of your like cachet, and then you know evaluating, does this make me feel good or not? And if it doesn't, then you say no. You know? Does that answer your question? You know, it, Ben, do you want to continue? I just want to say Rose is a badass artist. Oh, right <laughs> She on. did my favorite piece that was right uh, on. on the banks at the Finding Line uh, event at the Kennedy Center two years ago. I see you. Yeah. yeah. Great piece. No, it, uh, there is this question. It's also very complex. It says you all have a lot of uh, conversation uh, centered around grassroots organizing, which is great. But when can we discuss breaking systems of systematic oppression and white supremacy? Gentrification is a remnant of uh, Jim Crow kind of segregation. You know, so obviously, fundamental question. And in, in my mind, and maybe this helps me to just make a couple of closing comments, uh, unless we have a little more time. But um, you know, I've been very much thinking a lot about this. I mean, how do we produce new forms of resistance? new forms of engagement in this case, because somehow the strategies that we've enacted in the past haven't really worked. And I come from a place, Guatemala, you know, where revolution never gave us that much, just replaces ideo ideological supremacy with others. Uh, how do we produce a more incremental, in my mind, idea of change? I, I began to think. 
that would require maybe other forms of infiltration into institutions. So it's, you know, obviously when we break the systems of systematic um, oppression um, and exclusion, it might not be enough just to, just to protest for the sake of protest. I mean, we need to really, just like the skateboarders I mentioned earlier, begin to be more strategic in, in, in setting up a, a kind of process. Uh, in, in my mind, it's very much, because I teach visual arts, you know, there was this sort of idea of the historic avant-garde uh, who depended on a distance from the institutions so that the artists would be criticizing the institutions from the edges. I've been thinking a lot about that, thinking that the true avant-garde today, if we can even call it that, which is more to do with, with this type of thing and the artists that are performing these types of things, depends not on the critical distance, but more on the critical proximity to institutions, to infiltrating into institutions, to reorganizing protocols and resources, just like the skateboarders did in that case that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I think that, that, that really suggests a very different idea of resistance. I, I've been, and I hope it's, you know, I want to present it as a kind of, uh, how would I call it, wishy-washy, how do you say that in English, attitude, but I, I'm realizing that more and more what we need is interlocutors, facilitators of a, a new interfaces between top-down and bottom-up. Because what I've realized that what has, what has brought together the extreme right and the extreme left in this country is their disbelief in government, their disbelief in institutions. And I think that more today we cannot afford that in a sense. I, I, I still don't know why, how we find, our, find ourselves at this very moment you know, when, when we have endorsed as a country uh, someone that really is promising to completely erode the, the social safety net, to erode and, 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 and completely empty our capacity in terms of social and public you know, relevance. So our, how do we uh, break down the systems? We, we, we participate more intelligently. Uh, you know, I, I saw the, the film Selma late and I was crying, realizing that so much struggle has occurred for us to then find ourselves in this moment. So I don't know, I think it's a question for all of us to really engage, how do we truly more meaningfully participate in the dismantling of these types of uh, uh, make, uh, institutional mechanisms, but it would have to depend on very different strategies. You know, yeah. And also of not just following also our own biases and ideologies, which just perpetuate these sort of bubbles of polarization. I think that, uh, I, I, this by, by my summarize what I'm trying to say. I was sort of disaffected by some text that uh, Slavov Shishek, this famous philosopher, wrote about how Trump was maybe better uh, than Hillary Clinton because Hillary was just going to perpetuate this, the, the same sort of neoliberal dominance or whatever, that maybe having somebody like that would prompt us to reorganize ourselves. And I was thinking, are we that masochistic? Um, so I thought of writing a, writing a text or an essay that would call, just give me a nice neoliberal while we get our act together. <laughs> I think we cannot afford this, this moment. Yeah. I think it's up to us to create new histories regardless of the histories created from our ancestors where you're subjugating other yeah. people. And we always talk about thriving in the face of adversity, or I always talk about it with everyone, because any project you're gonna have problems, it's never gonna turn out the way you think. So I, I think this is, this is a very critical time, yeah. and, and projects of this nature, I think, are incredibly relevant to bring people together over work, just simple work. And there's lots of work to be done here. Yeah. On a daily basis, come out and help us, please. <laughs> Participation. May I say one more thing just, just in the context of that because it's another provocation a, a little bit in the context of this title of the essay, but obviously I've been thinking a lot about this too in the context of this sort of paradigm of pop-up public space, which even though I find hugely relevant and necessary, in fact I believe in a small scale development, but somehow that attitude has also is sort of legitimize the withdrawal of public investment in more robust, in a more robust construction of the public realm, public space, public infrastructure, education, and so on. So in other words, pop-up spaces have become the apology 
for the, dis the, the withdrawal of institutions from their commitments uh, to constructing you know, a more uh, accountable, let's say, public Im Im imagination. So one thing that it would be essential in this context is uh, how to make this not the exception, but the norm. Right. And how do we, in that process that I was mentioning of being more politically active, engaging institutions head on, that we might begin to pre put, put a lot more pressure in demanding a new, a new kind of public, public commitment. Uh, I think that in terms of infrastructure and redevelopment and, and so on. So I, I wanted to say that because how to increase the capacity of these spaces, uh, you were mentioning before, how to inject yeah. infrastructure, bathrooms, support, you know, it says, it cannot yeah. just be a kind of one off, how do you say that, one off or uh, just, you know, as tenuous and, and, and informal and powerful as it is, these are the kinds of projects that need so much more um, support and you know to build them up. Do we have time for one more question? Yeah? Okay. How do we begin to convince developers of the value of street art beyond using it as a means of accumulating capital? It's like educating your client, right? You kind of have to sit them down and be like, okay, this is what we need. This is what we have to look at. This is who we have to talk to. This is so it's really about like sitting them down and being like, this is how it's done. You know, because a lot of times clients will contact you and they don't, they're contacting you because you're the specialist. So if you sit them down and tell them what you need to do in order to make that project okay, then they might perhaps think about it. And you then have a choice to say, all right, I'm gonna do it or I'm not, depending on how they respond. So it's this back and forth. And I, and I often talk about this with some of, the, some of the youth that I work with and collaborate with is you have a choice to be there or not. If it doesn't feel good for you, you can turn around and walk out. So you know, if, if you feel like a developer is using you, you tell them what the real deal is and how it's done and why it's not done that way so that they can become educated. Because a lot of times people just don't know. They've been doing their job for so long that they just, they have no idea, right? They don't know what they're doing. So it's like really sitting them down and giving them the knowledge that they need to know in order to make informed mm. decisions. Do you have any? Well, you know, it is true that this is a constant process of negotiation. You have to negotiate with, you know, with the devil at times and to really get things done. But at the same time, you, you, you really say why, you know, in my case, I didn't want to wait for a client nor a developer as an architect. I decided that I was going to construct the client. Yeah. I was going to look for the, the community I wanted to work with. I, in fact, began to say, we have to be the developers of our own work. That's right. And there are mechanisms, obviously, and, and I think to visualize, to expose those mechanisms is part of the task. I wanted to just mention this because I, mentioned, I said that I was going to mention something about Max's project and the Gallaudet sort of triangulation here. This is beautiful. Kennedy brings the space here. Max sees an opportunity, proposes a, a grant for NASA, gets the grant, shapes a course on, 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 on measuring sort of the kinds of activities and the phenomena, right, developed in the skateboard, in the skateboard park itself, and then enables this process of visualizations and media. And again, this incredible sort of choreography of, of, of conditions begins to occur, and I think that is what builds up already a, a, a foundation, let's say, to, to a form of development. Because now I can imagine the students working on the visualizations might engage the community around to come and maybe engage children in, in understanding particular type of information or maybe the leverage of that grant can really summon others to really bring into the school or the school itself, which is a case that I've been trying to make for my own university, becomes partner in the co-development of those spaces. So I think that that's the kinds of process that, that might begin to emerge. So I'm more on the side, even though I agree with you, I've been in situations where I yeah. have to negotiate our case, you know, uh, uh, to give primacy to public and social content to what the developer wants to do. I, I said, I, I, I will, I, you know, maybe I, so, I, I don't want to deal with that anymore. I, I want to really yeah. be the shaper of a new briefs, new clients, new kinds of curatorial synergies. Uh, you know, and, and I think that's the task of all of us because all of us who are struggling trying to make a case for our own practices do it already. We are, in that sense, uh, very agile in, in trying to really connect things. I think that that, that would yeah, be relevant. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that when you do the work on your own, 
it, they will come. Like whoever wants to work with you will show up and be like, okay, we're ready to work with you. But I, I agree completely. Mm -hmm. All right. You want to read right. this one? I, I think, think that's we're actually, we're good. Yeah. That's pretty right. much it. I think we've gone to the the end of our time. All right. So we really want to thank these amazing panelists, activists, <laughs> culture makers. Thank you. Much of what they said really resonated with me, really was very, very powerful, um, especially about making, being the architects, being the designers of the work that we want, being, being the creators of the clients, being the creators of the audiences that we want, being able to imagine space. I mean, when you talked about creating um, the urban space with our bodies, you know, these are the things that we do very boldly and bravely. And I really appreciate the question that came about who is not on the panel. And, you know, Raymond actually already left, but um, High Arts and um, Garth, the Kennedy Center, and we put this together. So talk to us because we're here, except for Raymond, but you can still email him. Um, I think for me, I'm always looking at who is not in the room. We, we, I just came from a talk in New York last night about curating color that had a white woman from um, MoMA, who's a curator there, who just did the Jacob Lawrence, the whole Jacob Lawrence yeah. retrospective, which is amazing. Um, it had an African-American man who, of uh, Caribbean and African-American descent who is at St. Martin's in the Field Orchestra. And then it had an Afro-Puerto Rican woman who has a Bomba y Plena group. And, you know, look at our Arts in a Changing America site because we actually put every artist we've worked with to create a resource. When people say, these artists don't exist or these resources don't exist, we really want to show that the voices, the people are there, how to contact them, their biographies, et cetera. Um, so please, I welcome you to come speak with Garth Meek, my colleague Kapena Alapai is here, um, Ariel is here, um, Simone is here. So maybe just stand up and people can kind of see who you are from the Kennedy Center. There's Ariel, there's Kapena, um, there's Garth. And then we want to be, give a really big thank you to the empanada truck. I am starving, so I'm going to run over there and get something to eat. And then DJ Two Tone is going to be spinning again, and we're going to have some more time in the bowl. So thank you so much for coming, and we'll see you again. Thank you.